kind of averaging condition, it throws away information. And although it turns out that up through and including dimension three, bounded reaching curvature, meaning that this bilinear form is bounded when compared to the metric, implies that the sectional curvature is bounded in dimensions four and above that isn't true. So we wouldn't want to make the same assumptions as last time because it would not include the interesting issues. Um, nonetheless, we'll see that the discussion of last time is, is relevant, but the point is that we have to do more work to see what ex to what extent the hypotheses are satisfied. Okay. So uh, I want to remind you about the simplest uh, point about reaching curvature, about its geometric significance. So if I assume something about the reaching curvature, what does it tell me about the metric? So the general situation is that upper bounds on the reaching curvature are not particularly significant in and of themselves. In fact, in dimension three or higher, any manifold Admits uh, a metric of negative reaching curvature, and these are even dense in the C0 sense. So, this is the result of low count. On the other hand, lower bounds on the reaching curvature are geometrically significant, and if you assume a lower bound, then it, then it becomes significant to add an upper bound. You have a two sided bound, but an upper bound by itself uh, is not particularly significant. Um, so here's the geometric interpretation, if you like, of the region curvature. Uh, the, there are other related comparison-like facts, but here's the, the simplest one uh, to state. Not, not in a way the most basic, but the simplest is still very basic. And that is that the region curvature, a bound from below, controls the volume in the comparison sense. So namely, that you look at this ratio of a ball in your manifold with a definite lower bound on the reaching curvature to that in the space, simply connected space of constant curvature uh, with curvature h, which would then have reaching curvature n minus h times the metric. 
answer is minus a half for the velocity of dimension. 
same bundle to the two sphere. And in particular, the zero section is a totally geodesic S2, which sits inside of uh, this, this mountain. So now imagine that you scale the metric by multiplying distances by a small constant, epsilon. Now, when I scale the metric, it preserves the condition that the Ricci tensor is, is zero. But this metric is not flat, so the, cur the sectional curvature would blow up. Okay. Of course, it's asymptotic rapidly to this cone, so the volume stays bounded away from zero when I do the scaling, let's say the volume of the unit ball. And therefore, it doesn't collapse. In the limit, it looks more and more just like what it did at infinity, namely uh, R4 over Z2. Right? Unless I examine carefully a tiny neighborhood of uh, the vertex or singular point of this, and then I see in there that it's actually topologically non-trivial, and there's this tiny totally geodesic two-sphere in there. Right. So we see in this wonderful example, which satisfies almost every good property that we would like it to have, the curvature couldn't certainly be bounded. If, uh, if the curvature is bounded, small balls of a definite size are supposed to really have good coordinate systems on them. They're supposed to be topologically trivial and so on. So this example is a very good one uh, to keep in mind. And we see, without um, having yet given a formal definition of what it means to go to the limit, it's kind of just obvious in this picture. You scale it down a lot, you can't distinguish it with your eye uh, from a flat cone, right? From R4 divided by Z2. Uh, so we can go to the, the limit, and we see this kind of conical flat singularity, uh, an orbital singularity, if you like, R4 divided by Z2 form. And this, amazingly, although we started with the simplest non-trivial example, uh, really captures a lot about uh, singularity formation for Einstein manifolds in general. It doesn't capture everything, but it cap captures a lot. And the fact that we get cones for non-collapsed limits actually is not so difficult to see uh, from this relative volume comparison. And I'll try to make that uh, more explicit in the next lecture. But the fact that we somehow should get cones, uh, uh, namely if we pass to such limits where singularities form and then we examine the singularities under a sufficiently powerful microscope, the fact that we should see cones is intimately related to and somehow a consequence of relative volume comparison. If you want to prove it, it's not such an easy consequence, but it's kind of very believable from like, a relative comparison, volume comparison. Why is sometimes a PDK? Well, so first look at that comparison uh, when the lower bound is, is essentially zero. Uh, look at it when it's zero. Yeah, so okay. look, look at it first when it's anything. So it said that if, if you have a lower bound on Ricci, this ratio is a decreasing function. Yeah. Now you ask yourself, suppose that decreasing means weakly decreasing. Yeah. So suppose it's constant on an interval, then what would you expect to see? Well, you would expect to see some kind of rigid case. Yeah. So if it's constant on an interval, you can show without too much difficulty that it really looks like a warped product of whatever the sphere happens to be on that interval. And, and, and whatever the warping function was for the space of constant curvature, that is your lower bound. So for example, if the lower bound is zero and that function were constant, on some interval, you can show without too much difficulty that it will look like a metric cone of some cross-section, like an annulus and a metric cone of some cross-section. And so, if I want to say that when singularities form small, uh, and, uh, that they will look like cones, not in a non-collapse situation, 
that look like homes if I blow them up enough, if I inspect them under a powerful enough microscope. Notice first when I blow them up to inspect this tangent cone, so to say, under a microscope, I make the lower bound almost zero. So that's the first one. And from the, if I assume that the situation is non-collapsed, then you see on most scales that, that ratio of volumes has to be somehow very close to being constant. Because it starts out somewhere and it can decrease to one. There's, well, it's, it does, so to say, some bound below in the limit and it starts out somewhere. Yeah. So that, that's the intuition, which is uh, very close to the explanation, except the technical part is quite hard. Okay. So if we want to, so we, we admit now, if we admit this example that Einstein metrics don't automatically have bounded sectional curvature. Now, just like last time, even if we had bounded sectional curvature, we needed to know how do we recognize standard balls. And the answer was, that time, the volume isn't too small, then a concentric ball of a definite radius will be standard. Standard being a good coordinate system, topologically a standard ball, and so on. So we need similar theorems, but uh, they'll have to have stronger hypotheses that, well, we need appropriate theorems for the same question. If we want to understand anything about such manifolds, we have to know, the first question is, how do we recognize when a ball is standard? So typically, if you want to know if it's standard in some sense, then it's standard, right? You have to have some hypothesis. So you can think of it, that if it's standard in some sense, in a weak sense, then it's standard in a strong sense. That's the kind of theorem we like. And it's common in geometric analysis that standard in a weak sense means that the deviation from being standard is small enough. The last time I just had to be bounded, uh, but typically in, in this case where uh, you have an, an equation governing the metric, if things are close enough to being standard, then they're actually standard. So that's what epsilon are. The hypotheses tend to have, the theorems tend to have that. Okay. So, the next theorem that I'm going to state, so this was due to several people in the late 80s, uh, is, is such a theorem. So there are several such that are relevant, but there's one that plays a basic role in, in this lecture. One kind of previous result, and then one new result that I want to compare to it, valid only in dimension four as far as we know so far. So I'm going to state a result next that's proved by a standard technique in elliptic analysis called Moser iteration. So you don't really have to know what, what that is. Maybe you know what it is. If you uh, don't know what it is, that's all right, too. Uh, but there are several things to one could say about it. Uh, so I'll state the theorem in a minute, but let's just stick to the method of proof and make some general comments about it. So one is, it's, it's, it's kind of formal in a, in a way. So we know that in some sense uh, the metric satisfies an elliptic equation. And related to that, so the problem with that was if we wrote it in coordinates, we didn't know the size of the coordinate system. But here's something that you can calculate just invariantly. So this is just a computation. Use the Einstein condition and compute enough derivatives to find that the Laplacian of the norm of the curvature satisfies an inequality of this form. This, if nothing else, you can see that the sign is right because on a compact manifold, if you integrate at the left side, you get zero, so that should be bigger than something negative. Okay, so this is a computation. How does it each occur? Uh, well, I'm saying that you do, if you, the, the basic thing that you start with in this computation, so these are all asides, so if we get too far, it will just stop and uh, go back to the result. But the basic thing you calculate first is the Laplacian in the tensor sense of the curvature tensor. And this turns out to involve, as its highest order derivatives, really the Laplacian just of the region tensor. The Ricci tensor is a multiple of the metric, the highest derivatives drop out. Okay? And then you take norms and you get something like this. 
So it's just a point-wise computation where the highest derivatives drop out because they, they are, the, the fourth order derivatives are, turn out to be the Laplacian of not the full curvature tensor, but only the region tensor. Compute the Laplacian of the curvature tensor, the highest order part is the Laplacian of the region tensor. Other things drop out because of symmetries. So you have this, which is a kind of formal type of inequality. So this is one starting point. And then there's this machine that you can run called Moser iteration which starts with that inequality, you multiply both sides by powers of the curvature tensor, you integrate by parts, you do this and that, that's standard in analysis. And you wind up estimating by an inductive argument higher and higher LP norms, and in the limit, uh, you estimate the L infinity norm. So that's the iteration. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather tricky and surprising kind of argument because there's something in the argument that's making things blow up and something else that's making it converge even faster. So, okay. And the, what you have to know in this argument, the only thing you really have to know about the underlying space is nothing about topologically trivial, nothing about anything except the constant in the Sobel of inequality. Okay. Bounding, let's say, the oscillation of a function in terms of the gradient. So there's some constant which is like an isoparametric constant of the solar constant, and that's the only thing about the manifold that gets fed into this argument. Nothing else about the shape. So that's really the main point that I wanted to make. And in the theorem, which I haven't put up now, I'll put it up, there's a non-collapsing assumption. And the only role of that assumption is it enables you to estimate the constant in the solar so here now is, is, is the theorem. So maybe I should have put it up first, maybe not, but anyway, here it is. Okay. So it's an epsilon regularity, or maybe the way I've written it here, one should say delta regularity. So first of all, and this is in an arbitrary number of dimensions. So first of all, I have an Einstein manifold. I assume a definite bound on the Ricci tensor, which is two-sided bound, or bound on the Einstein constant, the constant of and then I make this assumption. Now, notice what I have on the left is the ln over 2 norm of the curvature, actually raised to the power n over 2. And what I have on the right is the quantity that enters into the definition of collapse. And so the hypothesis, and this is a constant which is small but independent of the manifold. So I should have written an epsilon of n because it's an epsilon. So the hypothesis is that the ln over 2 norm of the curvature is sufficiently small with respect to the collapse. Now the power n over 2, y n over 2. So this is like the critical case of the Sobolev inequality. It's just the case if you had anything bigger, it would be like curvature is actually found. One thing you can see if you don't know about the Sobolev inequality is that this quantity on the left is scale invariant. I multiply the volume, the volume by C, this would go up, the volume form would go up by C to the N, the curvature goes up by C to the minus 2, curvature to the N over 2 goes up by C to the minus N, they, they cancel. So the, both quantities here are scale invariant. That's one thing to notice. Uh, so this assumption is the closest thing, it's the strongest assumption of this type we could make. If you, for example, raise the power at all, it would be tantamount to assuming the curvature was bound. You couldn't have singularities formed, for example. Notice that both of these quantities are monotonic in R. Namely, it, certainly this one, because I'm integrating a function over a ball, if I fix the center and make R smaller, the integral will get smaller. But the quantity on the right is the collapsing uh, and by this bishop romov inequality relative volume comparison. Um, maybe I should put that one up. Um, the quantity on the right uh, see, gets bigger as R gets smaller. So what this says is that um, 
if a ball of radius r satisfies this estimate, then all smaller balls will satisfy the hypothesis as well, all smaller concentric balls. So that is uh, usually a very useful thing to know. If a ball looks standard in this sense, then uh, all smaller concentric balls will look standard as well. And now standard means that this conclusion holds, and how should we understand this, this conclusion? So if you transpose this to the other side, you would get that this product inside here is less than delta. Okay. So once, so what it's saying is that a grid that for general R, if you like, you can think of the case R equals one, right? So think of the case R equals one. It says once this times the inverse of that is less than a definite a constant delta that doesn't depend on the manifold, then on a ball of half the size, the curvature is actually pointwise bound, right? But in order for this estimate to be true, this, this quantity, ln over 2 norm to the n over 2 times the uh, reciprocal of the collapsing has to be sufficiently small. Right? That's one way of looking at it. Once it's sufficiently small, less than delta, then the curvature on the ball of half the size is delta just times r to the minus 2, which is the way curvature scales so far as 1. It's that, uh, such a ball is bounded. Another way you can think of the conclusion once the hypothesis is satisfied is that this is a ball in the model space. So we know what this is. This is basically like r to the m. It's bounded by a constant times of, let's say, the worst case is hyperbolic. But, so this, when we take the 2 over n root, is like r squared if we cancel this. And again, a different way of looking at it is once this is satisfied, then we have a pointwise bound, and the bound is the average uh, of this. So it's the normalized ln over 2. So that's a different way of uh, thinking of what the conclusion is. So, so this is the epsilon regularity theorem that's uh, where the hypothesis is, is strongest. Uh, this is as close to as possible to assuming bounded curvature and yet not assuming it. So if this thing is small enough, then we effectively get bounded curvature on a smaller ball. Now, of course, this is maybe a good time to, to realize that so a theorem like, theorems like this are, of course, useful. It's good to know what are the con consequences of any assumption that you might make. And so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you might ask yourself in practice, uh, how am I going to know whether this is the assumption is satisfied? That's, that's a different issue. So you kind of come at it in both directions. You can start, if you have some hypothesis that you know is a consequence of other assumptions, you could ask, what does that tell me? Or from the other end, you can start with a strong hypothesis, then you have to worry, can I, on the basis of other assumptions, ever say that that hypothesis is satisfied? Okay. Now here is a more or less immediate corollary by a standard covering argument. You get the following. Suppose that we just assume that this bound uh, on the whole amount, that this quantity that was supposed to be small on a ball of a given size to get the epsilon regularity theorem just has a definite bound on the amount of ball. And what can we say from that? Well, I am clear that then imagine balls of radius 1, let's say. Okay. So there can't be too many disjoint balls of radius 1 which fail to satisfy uh, if I assume it's non-collapsed. So that means balls of radius 1 have a definite size. The hypothesis of the previous one is that the integral is small with respect to, sufficiently small with respect to the collapsing. If I give myself a lower bound on the collapsing, then there can't be too many disjoint balls, let's say, on which the hypothesis is, is violated. If I give myself both the collapsing and a bound on the integral norm. So this would then say, in a situation like this, if it's not too collapsed and the ln over 2 norm is bounded, then away from a definite number of points, the hypothesis of the epsilon regularity theorem would be satisfied. And the conclusion is that you get a pointwise bound that looks like something like this. So 
set of points at which things are really uncontrolled only has a definite cardinality. And in fact, um, where does it go? So this is really just uh, the bound on the cardinality is some constant times the inverse of the non-collapsing and times the bound on uh, the uh, ln over 2, the integral of r to the n over 2. Okay, so this one, I think I want to hold aside because I want to say later that in dimension 4 we're going to do better than this. Now, in what I just said, oh, okay. So let me say one more thing. So what we said then was there, if we assume it's not too collapsed, and we assume this bound, then there'll be a definite number of points such that away from those points, it just looks like what we studied last time, bounded curvature. Since it's not too collapsed, in addition, things will just look standard. Now, what does it look like near the points? Well, if we imagine rescaling the, the picture, then that is examined. Imagine that things are really concentrated. The curvature is really, uh, the integral is still big so that the hypothesis isn't satisfied with the epsilon regularity theorem, even in a very small neighborhood of the points. Now we can imagine rescaling the whole picture. <coughs> the, the volume, uh, the, the Ricci curvature bound now is close to being zero, so it will look Ricci flat. The integral will still have a definite bound, so if we're in dimension four, it should look somehow we would expect the rescale picture near the singularities like this example. Gucci Hansen manifold, maybe in higher dimensions, but something like that. So we'll see, we expect to see something like that. The main point being that the two sided bound on Ricci becomes now small. So it will look Ricci flat after rescaling. The integral bound will persist. And where do you move the dimension is for? This is in any number of dimensions. I guess that this other example is for, but yeah. in higher dimensions, similar examples. Feature. Yeah. Haven't used for yet, but I will presently. Okay. So what I'm saying is you could blow it up, but then you might possibly see if you inspected it under the microscope, you blew it up, it would look roughly like that, but maybe there would be more concentration points. Okay. But the concentration points and the number of repeated blow-ups you have to do is somehow controlled by the parameters we assumed. And you get kind of a tree every concentration point, you blow it up, you might see some more things where it looked very concentrated, so you blow up again, but so you get like a tree, but the size uh, of that tree uh, is easily seen to be bounded. And this is the picture of what things uh, look like. So that's called a bubble tree, that picture of concentrations, concentration being bubbles. So now, um, now suppose we ask what could we salvage, if anything, out of this if we threw away 
has sufficiently collapsed with our two previous hypotheses. Um, so that's the opposite of the other case where we assumed it was non-collapsed. Now assume that it's sufficiently collapsed. Then, away from a definite number of points, uh, right, this N of C is again just some multiple of C, definite multiple of C. Uh, away from a definite number of points, it's collapsed uh, with bounded curvature after local rescale. So that's his observation. It's actually not a difficult observation. It's sufficiently collapsed. And so the question is, you know, if you were, if you were uh, given a point, how would you find this radius that occurred in the previous definition? What's the radius? What's the scale? Well, one thing you could imagine looking at a ball of radius one. Maybe you would be lucky, and it would already uh, let's let's imagine not just as bounded curvature, but let's think a ball of radius one might perchance satisfy the hypothesis of the epsilon regularity. The other possibility is that it doesn't. So then we start considering smaller concentric balls. And eventually, now, the one quantity is going up and the other one is going down. The integral is going down, the collapsing is going up. So uh, eventually, there, in, in the end, one is zero and the other is one. So they started out like this. and at the end, it will be the opposite, if you think about it. So somewhere they must cross. Yeah. So imagine we're going to find this scale by applying the epsilon regularity theorem. We're going to, OK. So we pick a point. One possibility is that the hypothesis is satisfied yeah. for balls of radius point. The other hypothesis is that the integral now, we now think that this manifold is, after all, very collapsed. Yeah. A definite amount, but we should think of it as quite collapsed. So the other possibility is maybe there's too much curvature relative to the collapsing. 
connects with the point I raised earlier that for, for and of course this was previously well known, that if I wanted, so you know, I wrote, let's assume that the integral of curvature to the n over 2 had a definite bound. In dimension 4, you get this from the topology, so that's good, right? So it's not an a priori assumption, it's a consequence of the topology, more or less given to you in a reasonable sense. Uh, this sort of thing will return in the next lecture. Okay, but you know, we use this in a much stronger way, which I'll try in the time that's left to indicate. And so here's the first theorem, which which I want to mention in dimension four, if I can find it. I want to compare it to the previous one. Okay. So here was our previous epsilon regularity theorem. And here's the one in dimension four. And the difference is, of course, that in higher dimensions, the previous one, we have an assumption that this is small with respect to the collapsing. And what I'm saying is in dimension four, you just assume it's small. You just need to assume that it's small. So this then allows you to study collapsing in dimension four. So this is, this is a big point. Hypothesis here, you have to assume it's small with respect to collapsing. Here, you don't need to assume it's small with respect to collapsing. It can be as collapsed as you want. And uh, you still get a bound from the curvature. So this is the first new uh, result. Uh, all the... Three is n minus one. Yeah, they always make this normalization. It's a normalization. And then... And then and then I have this. Okay, so this is the first one, and then as a consequence, uh, by similar reason, we have a covering argument to what we had last time. We get this. So again, a definite number of uh, of blow up points, but where the number uh, depends is independent of the collapse. It's independent of the collapse. Now the point of so this is depends on the original micro, you can estimate it given the micro you can estimate given the bound on the order characteristic and that the metric has been normalized in this way, and that's it. Okay. There are so many points where it can blow up, and away from those points it's bounded, moreover. So if you imagine, you fix the manifold, imagine a collapsing sequence now in higher dimensions, let's say. What? I don't know. The integrand is positive. That's right. So it's always positive. So imagine that the thing that, that you have a manifold which satisfies these bounds in higher dimensions, which is very collapsed. Then you would have a lot of these points, right? And so if you imagine like a collapsing sequence on a fixed manifold, they could be getting denser and denser. And you couldn't say that there was any point in the limit where the curvature was bounded near that point. And you couldn't say very much about the structure of the limit, although it turns out that it is rectifiable in some sense. But let's, from this point of view, you can't conclude very much about the limit from this theorem. Yeah. If it's collapsing and the diameter, let's say, is bounded, then these get more and more points, and they're getting, therefore, denser and denser. They can't separate out. Uh, they might. They might be filling up the whole thing. You can't be 
here, no matter how collapsed it is, even if the diameter is bounded, there are a definite number of points where the curvature is big and away from that is controlled. So away from these definite number of points, it's like last time. It's really collapsed with bounded curvature, not just locally bounded curvature, but away from these points actually with bounded curvature. These points have any geometric meaning before you've done this collapsing? No, no. I mean, uh, they're the points where uh, you know yeah. the curvature is too concentrated for uh, the hypothesis yeah. of the epsilon regularity to hold on any collapse scale. Do they have kind of models of what's happening Well, you can look at the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Basically, yeah. if you blow it up suitably, then. You expect to see some breachy flat thing, but it might not have the equilibrium volume growth. And okay, so away from these points, everything you know about collapse with bounded curvature, you know, right? So uh, before that, in dimension four, it was just this, which is not very much collapse with bounded average. So this is definitely a step forward. Um, Usual the number of points is just proportional. Does it make sense? What's that? It, does it make sense to replace these points by something smooth? But so is there kind of the well, it, what you will see there if you blow it up will be look like uh, complete uh, Ricci flight, but not necessarily you putting yeah. volume. Okay. And indeed, there are examples like that. Uh, Famous one in its own area now due to Gross and Wilson connection with this uh, uh, mirror symmetry. Yeah. All right. Now here's here's another thing. So this is 
volume actually decays exponentially. So you get the same kind of picture as, let's say, with the Riemann surface degenerating. Now, you, you, you don't measure the volume, of course, just from one point, but from these concentration points, like the Riemann surface. And uh, it actually decays exponentially as measured uh, away from the concentration points. Uh, so this wouldn't be obvious for Ricci curvature, because saying the Ricci curvature is negative isn't really saying anything in general about Einstein in dimension, because they're C0 dense. But Einstein in dimension 4 it turns out to be very strong. Okay. And so this is just a remark that um, the C1 not equal to 0 uh, is, is necessary, because there are known examples, even one worked out in great detail by Gross and Wilson about how things can collapse on K3 three uh, surfaces, even with bounded diameter. And then the theorem about only finitely many points where the curvature grows up is quite consistent with the example that they worked out in great detail. OK, so now I want to just take a minute or two to give a very brief indication about the proof, and then I'll stop for today. So let me, so what does this transgression form have to do with anything? How do you use it? So, of course, the main thing to remember is if I prove something about Gaspinet, then dimension four, I've actually estimated the norm squared of the curvature, which is everything. Uh, let me remind you of the definition of the maximal function of a function. I take its average value over balls of radius r and take the super value. So that will uh, let me use that definition. Now, I explained earlier how you find the scale on which something is collapsed with what would be about the curve. You have these two things that are equal, and if you just inspect them, what it says, it basically leads you to this inequality. There are two exponents, two parts to the exponent. The numerator, n minus 1, comes from the fact that this is an n minus 1. And the 1 over n uh, comes from inspecting the epsilon regularity theorem, because where these two things are equal. If you kind of shift things around, that gives you something about the quantity of which the soup is the maximum function. So from the explanation I gave before, and scaling, this is almost uh, clear. Basically, it is clear. The proof is very short. Together, of course, <coughs> with the fact that in the case of bounded curvature, the form is bounded. So it's bounded after you rescale by the factor r and uh, r p. And that's where this estimate comes from. The fact that for bounded curvature, it's bounded, and how you find the scale uh, on which uh, it looks locally, about collapsed with locally bounded curvature. So this estimate is not difficult. It holds in all dimensions. Now, let me uh, try to then just say in a transparency or two of what's involved in, in this uh, theorem over here. Okay. So I want to estimate this in, in dimension 4. It's the same thing as estimating the integral of the Gaussian form. So I have something which transgresses the Gaussian form. Naturally, I want to use Stokes' theorem, right? Now, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's a good start. So let's uh, take so here, imagine I have the gauss form. I, I, I multiply it by the cutoff function, which is 1 on most of the manifold. Uh, and it goes to 0 before things get uh, too concentrated. And that's bounded gradient. So a standard cutoff function, nothing fancy. OK. So if I use Stokes' theorem and I integrate, uh, if I use Stokes' theorem, then I'm led to this conclusion. I have this volume of z, which was this, this thing over here, m minus the balls is what I call z. And I, I have this on both sides for a reason. You know, of course, I could get rid of it. So here, I have v, the cutoff function, times integral of gauss I want to, for some reason, divide it by z. So I did that over here. And then I have area of this annulus where the cutoff function lives upstairs and downstairs.
So this is just Stokes' theorem. Now, let's observe that we have, on the one hand, this bound. So maybe by now, we can put this one over here. Okay. So on the, on the right hand side, uh, we have this bound on the norm. And now, if there's a standard inequality, you don't usually see it, see this one, but it's the proof of all the other, and it's the same as the proof of other inequalities on the maximal function. So this is hard to literally with maximal function. And this is a standard kind of inequality that relates the norm of the maximal function, in this case, to a power less than one to the integral of the function. Here, it should really be the absolute value that that was done here. Uh, so if I take the alpha root of both sides, this is like the L alpha norm, but the novelty is alpha is less than one, is less than or equal to the L1 norm of the function with a constant that depends on alpha. And for this inequality, you need alpha is strictly less than one. In the three quarters up there, remember that's the n minus one over 